There's a lot of background noise, but I'm I'm trying to listen very carefully. Same thing. Right now, and how we're moving forward in the future. 
Um, we will have an employee appreciation day and an anniversary practice party later this month um, in October to help them with that. On that as well, I want to particularly mention I have it sent out to this part of the snapshot system in the FBA before the start of the project. Thought about you know, very overly mentioned about the history of the author's special form of the relationship that Kat enjoys with the And lastly, in the three stages update um, for today, we want to kind of touch on the service mods timeline of what um, Kat has sent out to me, but also what you have been giving as a board as well. Um, we just wanted to, I know we're going to be talking about um, service mods today, and remember these are temporary service mods, but they operate a little differently um, than, a, than a permanent change in anything. Um, but nonetheless, we know how important communication is regardless, and, and you can see the robust effort that's gone into the amount of either introduction of these um, in public meetings, whether it's being committee meetings or regular board meetings, the number of communications in the board snapshot material, um, the amount of times it's been addressed in the media, um, public comments we've received, we've had up on the website, uh, media releases and legal notices both combined around it. And you can see it's just very comprehensive um, set of engagements. We also, so that's sort of the, the board facing and, and public facing side. But you also know what important partners the operators are um, in a temporary service model protection. And we have been uh, having meetings with all of the operators to seek their input um, and to incorporate that into the work that we've been doing. Mr. Dennis has um, engaged a lot of that. Um, and then uh, Chatham Connects, um, the service lines were addressed during a Chatham Connect community event. Um, we've done text alerts around this, and social media posts. And we have upcoming plans. One of the things that we're going to be discussing today is a proposed um, expansion. This was also included in your last, um, it was actually a snapshot of the I believe, um, where we're talking about from the downtown group of the deep of the dot um, that there would be an expansion um, of that current uh, ferry service into Cloverdale Park Heights neighborhoods. Um, as a part of the service, temporary service modification. Um, and we're sure to notify those areas that will have the opportunity to um, engage in that modified service with door handle signs so that everyone in the neighborhood makes sure that they get that information. Um, there's these flyers at the top plus top ridership bus stops, just as we've done in the past to notify about big things that are coming, service events. Uh, but this service modification will also be notified at the shelter where we're, uh, our passengers board and, um, and at the park on um, their trip on, on CAP. There will be banners up at the ITC, uh, continued media outreach, and then uh, uh, additional uh, evaluations that will be performed um, all during uh, the month, all during the time frame of that service mod that will result in regular communications that will occur. And again, just as we always have, we're going to keep the board up to that on those things as well. But you can see there's been a very uh, robust and um, deep reaching uh, communication effort around this discussion and looking forward to um, making that modification to bring service reliability um, back to us. Next slide. Um, that was one. Let me just say that. One of my concerns is more about um, CEO mentioned door handles and flyers. Yes. Those are one of the things I was going to mention because, see, you know, we in this world where we want to get rid of it, not having like paper, but there are folks that will probably never go to like Facebook or stuff like that. And my concern is more about ensuring that the information is given to the people who really, really need the information. So I think that should be some way to people that are visually impaired or I think we should cover all of our bases and yes. ensure that you know we can have this outreach. You know, I don't know how you how you gauge who attend 
you better be able to attend or really people are impacted by these changes. I don't know how you gauge that. But, but I think when you talk about the bus stops and where people gather to use our services, there should be something tangible, either if the drivers have a flyer or whatever, that kind of keeps them updated on what's happening. Because um, I don't know, I, I'm out of the field. There's some buses that I'm really concerned about. So I'm making it my business to go to these stops. And what I'm hearing is, we didn't know that. So somehow we're not getting information to who we need it from. So I just, you know, just be, let's just be a little bit more conscious of how we get it out. Dr. Robinson, can you share with us to which particular stops just so we can make sure we follow up? Well, I, I normally do the 31. Yes, ma'am. Because mm -hmm. the, the one I look at the ridership on 31 is very, very robust. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these are all the folks on 31 are working together. These are not just going out for credit. I mean, they're either going to Walmart or going to CVS, they're picking up medicine, they're picking up groceries because they're trying to get the work from one place to the other and make the connections. And, and um, these are people really serious about transit and they really need transit. Um, also, I look at the 20 and the four Barnard, and when I look at the modifications, I ask some questions about those folks. Well, we're going to talk about the service lines in more detail, but I appreciate your input on that. We completely agree with you, and that's why we uh, came up with the idea of putting the door hangers um, to do, again, to do the flyers in the shelters themselves, um, but understand some of that additional big groups that you just spoke to. We'll make sure that we incorporate that into our ongoing efforts. So I appreciate that. I have one other question. Can yes. we talk about expansion? I just want to understand what went into choosing Cloverdale and Park It's because those are two neighborhoods that are currently served by the 29 and we're considering modifications to the 24 and that would have left them with less than adequate service um, potentially. And there had also been, in new, there, both in our communication with the operators as well as communications with the community. Um, in some of these events that we've had, there's been a, a, an ongoing discussion about fair free versus fair services and where that is in the community. And this was an opportunity to look at that um, and consider that, especially as that kind of information would feed forward into the master transit plan effort and an evaluation of those considerations as well. For the future, was there any consideration as relates to the um, arena? And transportation to the arena in that area? Well, that, that also serves the arena. Right. right. Um, in, in terms of just the marketing as well, I do think it's, it's we, we really want to do this is probably the biggest service change we've made in decades in terms of just the amount of um, routes that are being changed and modified in some way. And it is, it's a lot of information. and trying to talk with anybody about a lot of information is really, really hard. Um, one thing that I do, one of the graphics that y'all have developed that I think is great is one that just lists out all the buses and stuff um, and, and the variations of the modifications that we're doing. It's the one page, yeah, if you can fit it on a page, great. And I would really push that one forwards. Um, I've been looking for it on social media or on Facebook and I know it's not there yet. And I would just hit it as hard as you can. Um, and then what can you tell me about in the bus? What are we doing in the bus? So we're doing, um, what are we doing in the bus? If, if, if it would be possible to hand a flyer to every person that got on the bus, I would take it for that. I think it would be that. Yeah, I think just sort of like heads up and then they get a flyer. Sure. And also trying to get them to sign up for the text message thing. If, Fellow board members, if you guys aren't signed up for that, definitely do because it is my thing. That's a pretty powerful system. One thing. May, may I make a comment when it's appropriate? Yes, Director. Um, I can't speak for the city, but I know the county has a um, government channel, and possibly our public affairs officer could post this on the government channel which surprisingly enough, a lot of people do watch it. I think that's an excellent suggestion, Director. We'll make sure to incorporate that as well. 
One thing I do want to be sure I reiterate here um, um, that this is a temporary service modification. We right, right. The but last it's six to nine months. And this is just to sort of some of the things that you're saying. It, it, is, it is very impactful right now, but it will be very impactful in bringing back some really uh, incredibly um, poor service reliability that we have right now. It is more impactful, um, I think, to those of you who are our, our regular patrons and folks that are attending on this to get them to place. So just keep Absolutely. in mind, I just want to reiterate again that this is a temporary service mod. And the reason that we know that and we're going to talk about that in the presentation is the things that we are doing to make sure that over the course of this temporary service mod, we're going to be working every day to bring back service, whether that's bringing it back with hiring of operators or a couple of other ideas that we have that we're going to talk about today on some things we can do over the life of that service mod until we grow ourselves back to the service levels for, yeah. so I, I, just sure I would also add that the marketing I've seen, I think it is clear that tax is um, very truthful about this is this is the challenge we're having. Here's our solution to it. And, and I think being really confident in doing that is I'm all for it. It's it's really it's interesting coming. too because in the after conference that I just attended, there was a, a particular panel on leadership. And it was interesting to listen to my peers across the country, whether they were in systems the size of a Los Angeles or whether they were in systems smaller than ours. It was a comprehensive discussion where the same kinds of things were being, the same challenges being met with in, in very similar ways across the country, largely based upon that operator shortage. And it was interesting to hear people articulate exactly what we're doing here, which is you acknowledge the problem, you state the reason for what's being, why it's being caused. You go ahead and acknowledge what you're going to do to solve it. And then you move forward in a very transparent, very robust way of engaging um, in doing that. And so it was interesting to see that we're following that path that our peers across the country are following. Yes. Um, can you think about the areas where the board has been or we They'll work hand in hand with areas we're going to change, but in those areas in that neighborhood where there will be such a change in like where they kept and stuff, we're going to literally cover every house. And, and the reason we did that is because that's a more effective way that a public meeting, you can have a public meeting, but people will come and tell people why they can't come, why they can't be working, or why they can't be responsible, or, or they just can't get there for whatever reason. And, and so we wanted to be sure that we met people where they were. That means right here on the board. When did we have that? I think it's this end of this week. End of this week. Yeah. And again, I just want to reiterate to this important information to be with people in whatever way necessary that they get the information. In whatever way they can. Yeah. That's really important. Thank you for that. Um, our next immediate day is service delivery, and it is um, while uh, our Mr. Bemis, our assistant operations director, is again today, we can remember that report. Um, he's doing it now with our new CRO um, right, right beside him. So I want to take a moment to introduce um, Dr. Emmanuel Tomasi, Dr. Manny, as we all call him. Um, we are delighted that he is here, and next month he'll be doing this report. But um, the, an opportunity today for him to see Mr. Dennis do his expert job. Good morning, everyone. And of course, uh, we certainly welcome Dr. Manny. I will see you all and today. He gets to see, unfortunately, a kind of quicker <laughs> response. To the you know, committee uh, update not only was that this last week. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time calling the details of this report. I believe it's included in your information. So the, the short of it is that uh, as you go on to the next slide, is that there are not many changes that we can face from last month to this month. And in most likelihood, we will see a similarity in the next month report for the month of October. However, in the month of December, when we now in the month of November, I'm sorry, we will report be reporting 
No, I had it right. December, we will be reporting November's data, and we expect to see a noticeable change. Not as many missed miles, not as many missed trips. Uh, the numbers should change drastically. That's why we're doing the service modification based on the number of operators. So when you see this again, your numbers about will remain to be about the same. Uh, this is your safety report, accident incidents that we have just for the month and the type of uh, safety, weekly safety blitz that we've covered. Next slide. Uh, your training update is uh, again, we have the CBL of paratransit. We hired three, two remain out of that group. They don't require a CBL license, but we had none for fixed route. But it's, I'm glad to announce that we will be doing an interview this week for some fixed route operators will apply. We hope to continue to do that in the months and weeks to come and continue to we get to the number that we so desire to have 110 full time fixed right six operators. Six operators to add job service. Let me ask yes. a question. When I look at that, it's not in our packet, it's on our um on the internet but I mean on our um that text message. Yes. Our email. That's email. When I look at that so we're saying that in September we hired no fixed route drivers. That is correct. Zero. Zero. Nobody applied. We hired one. There, there could be various reasons, either applications were low, or it could be some folks could not pass the background checks. We've had all of the above. Some, but there were there are all kinds of reasons why a month might see zero times. Yeah, but we that we hope to change going forward again with the applicants. That we have again, as we said, some things can uh, prohibit us from making that selection, but it's not that we're not accepting applications. Okay, so so the question, so I guess what you're telling me is that you had applications in September, but none of them came down for fixed route. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Because I really want to ask this because I'm a little bit concerned about there's a need of problems and there's people that want to work, right? Okay, we want a whole month. And that is really drivers and uh, we didn't hire anybody. But if you're telling me that we got applications in September, that's only different not getting any applications whatsoever. That's they correct. just didn't pan out. That's, that, that's that what we said. We said we had applications. And so we are setting up interviews to uh, continue those applicants that have applied and will be applied. We've also had situations, Dr. Robinson, you know, it's just a, it's a very um, interesting labor market right now. Um, so besides the fact that we've got um, that we have folk apply when they ultimately can't get through the process, we also have folk apply who accept the position and then they come the first day and turn some tears and happen by come the first day and they go, well, I'm not sure this is really what I want to do. And I think that's I think that would be interesting for me, at least for me to see in the report. You so know, instead of showing zero, you know, that to me, um, because the other thing too is you know, when you talk about how competitive all of Especially when it comes to salaries, you know, why why is nobody not coming to get? That would concern me. You know, we talk, I see what we're gonna ask them for a raise, you know, but um, you know, but anyway, I would like to see instead of seeing zero, I would love to see some reason. Yeah. <laughs> no, we can absolutely do that, although I hope this is the last month we will see that. I hope so. Um I I believe <laughs> that with some of the efforts that we're undertaking, I believe with salary, um, you know, when when the when the union failed to ratify and those salary increases that were negotiated and proposed at the time did go into effect, you know, that was that took a, a tool out of our toolkit, so to speak, right? Um, in terms of how we were recruiting out there and where that put us with lots of other folks, not only in this area, but in, in just you know, sort of the operator space, generally speaking. So um, I, I do believe that this was probably, I'm not going to call it a unique month because recruitment of operators has been difficult and we acknowledge that. But I would say that a month where there's zero is a unique month. And I think that next month and in the coming months, especially with some of the other things that we're doing, Start to see a turn on that. And also, um, what's the minimum age for for um, fixed rod drivers for, for cat? It is twenty three years of age now. <laughs> Might want to take a look at that. Twenty three. Twenty three fixed rod. Is there a reason for that? Because just if a person now go to college at seventeen, graduates at twenty one. Um, Goals, I just said, no, but I want to have a bus. That person can drive 
even if they did a CDL and that's education at 20 times. But they can't work for CAT because the hours is at 23. And that is right, that makes us not as competitive. Not the age that would be the experience sector. Uh, yeah. There are several factors there, and again, I'll leave this here. There are factors from, from our insurance insurance carrier, reliability, experience, all those things are factored in as to why the age limit was 23. Um, we are, however, revisiting that, asking the question, trying to determine whether or not we can reduce that to 21. How old would you have to be to get a CDL? I don't know the age limit on what that's required to get a license. More so based on the age limit. I don't know the age limit. I'm sure maybe that I need to follow up with the fact. Because I think it's like 18. Yeah. yeah. To get a CDL. I think it is. Yeah. 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 So if you're eight, if you can get a CDL at 18, even if you make them a junior, junior driver or part time driver. And what that does, that cuts out some of your interests. Yeah. Maybe they maybe they start out on paratransit or not. And we certainly have all those things wrong. But we realize that we're trying to by any means necessary. And uh, in fact, in that event we had this past Saturday, I spoke with a young lady who was in high school and she was interested in setting setting up a program that we can get them from high school again in some type of program, get them early and build them up to the place that we need. Well, we're doing that also, um, for the, even on the maintenance side as well. We are working with the, in the technical um, programs in the high schools uh, and uh, met with the public school system recently to talk about that and say, what can we do to help around some of the curriculum we need to train folks to be able to work with like professors, for example. Um, Mr. Flanders, and I know Mr. Flanders is actually working with now for the adult curriculum. Also, him and the, uh, I guess, uh, you know, she's not just getting out of military. You know, if he's going to 18 for a year, the 22, he might already have a CDL doing transportation, just like the one that Fort Stewart and Army did. But you can come up with that for a whole year. It's actually done for four years. But you are, you are qualified. You've been to combat, you've been to all the different training, but you can stop with us. I think this is a very good point that you're bringing. We're exploring 21 now, so we will accelerate the foundation of the that we get that back to you all. Um, you know, kind of what we find out about that by with, with our board that we need to be will be ready. Y'all be ready to report back to me. Yeah, I have one of the questions when I think about this, though, when I look at the documents that we were given as far as policy, it wasn't 23 in our policy. But it is on our application. I think in the policy is like 21. I think 21 or 19 is already the age, but the application says 23. So we need to make sure those things match. So I, I, think, I think there's some discrepancy there as well. We will look at that also. Um, yeah, I appreciate that for comments. Excuse me, I can't see that document. One of the documents is there entry for um, how many? Personal loss. Um, not yet. No. Okay, I don't think that's okay. I just make a suggestion because, you know, if the higher five is four or higher four is five, mm -hmm. we're going to add the volume. Right. No, and absolutely. That, and, and that needs to be known so we know where we are. Uh, when it comes to percentages, we need to know when it comes to personal loss. The separation is um, having the reporting under the financial report under the human resources. Um, right. And I don't recall right now, top of my head, what I said up there, if we had them to operate or purchase other kinds of positions, but we'll be certain that. So okay. we do have it. We have it that way on the um, director. We'll be sure to call it out when this better presents. All right, we'll take you to the next slide. It's going to be folks on contact performance. Uh, there is no very little change there. And also your um, time points leave it early, early departure, late departure. They're pretty much within sentencing guidelines at five minutes. The ones that we focus on primarily out of all this is when you put location what we consider to be in or the beginning of a route. And an example you see under five uh, early 
concealed with a mall. That's kind of the point where it should be no exception. And so when we get those, we can talk to the operator, remind them not to leave early, leave on time, leave a little too later, uh, then leave them early. Yes. Now, how will the proposed modification? What kind of impact would that have on that report? On the on time the farm. Longer, uh, you know, whatever, whatever happens with that route. Right. There, so there's some things to be determined as we said that we will change monitoring week to week, month to month, because what in some cases you will have crowding, overcrowding, because there may be a less bus, but you have standing room only. That will impact on time performance, but the ridership will increase. That means you're stopping to go more often, more frequently. So it may have a negative impact on, on time, but again, we'll watch it, we'll adjust it accordingly. If we have the extra operators available, we will also send an additional bus that can pick up that schedule and then you know, enhance those numbers. And it can also potentially impact that cost. That's correct. It, it can do both, depending on the route and depending on who. Ridership as it depends to just describe that on time performance on certain routes. On certain routes, yeah. And we expect to do them, but certainly just the reliability of the complaint, we're going to be there at, at you know, next time, and we're going to get you to the place where you're trying to go to the time, we're going to be able to do it versus what's happening right now, which is the reliability. And I would think just the opposite, we wouldn't be able to do it. We wouldn't be able to Bus with more people, and um, that's gonna take some time. It may not be a long time, but could be time to get me getting to where I need to be, you know, simply because I put packing more people on the bus, you know. And also, the other thing, too, is with the um, I don't know how we're having this based on COVID restrictions. We'll just start on question. Well, the regulations now permit us to go back to the same Yeah. Yeah. So, so that standard room allows us to transport. Yeah. We still encourage folks to wear masks. So, we, we really want to fix the wrong response standing room to, to cover up for those missed uh, opportunities. And so, more passengers, if they choose to, they can get on that bus and, and choose to stand and without having to wait for the next bus to come along. Yes. So your ridership there is uh, about the same on the fixed route um, as it was last month. So not much changes. It is up, but not much. And then strips again compared to last month. Again, this goes on to put the short. So we are addressing that. We expect those changes to be noticeable in the next month. So uh, next time. Paratransit. On time performance for paratransit is um, slightly up uh, compared to last month. And then our ridership is down compared to last month. Um, this trips, uh, there we have more missed trips for the month of September than we did in August. We expected that again because of the bad schools back in. There's a constant increase for more service for paratransit. Change this time of year when kids are back in school, everything's open up. There's a demand uh, that we have that we try to meet because it continues to go up um, each month. Um, no shows on that for the month is about the same um, for the paratraffic service on time. Uh, Mr. Two. Yes. When you define missed trips, and that means actually somebody called and didn't get a ride. Yeah. Yeah. And and what my concern is, I think, I think, I think, um, our CEO addressed it before is that we're doing our best to find a way. I think that should be noted that if someone calls it, maybe show up, we'll find a way to send somebody to get that person, you know, to where they need to be. And I think that's important. And I, I, I think that I would love to see these numbers go down instead of going up. Can you manage, can you manage the schedule? Uh, how many drivers we have that day? So if we can't take a person when they call, we can get that person to reschedule their appointment and schedule the trip with you. So how that works is yes, and the shorter that is that on the actual day because it 
drive when they call out. No, I mean yeah. before on the, on the day that they schedule it. Like when like when we're scheduling ourselves, do we say we can do two hundred trips a day? So once you get people who call in and you're at say you're at one seventy five today, and then tomorrow you're at two twenty five. When you hit two hundred, do you tell people we don't we have we no longer have slots for that day? Right. That's something that we don't do. It's something that the regulation does not allow us to do to say to someone, we we'll reach a max, we can't do anything else, or we want you to know we've already reached our max for that day. We have to continue to take those reservations. But we did let folks know that there are issues with our office. Yeah, but there should be some so say there should be something in the there should be something in the law or the policy. <laughs> Or the regulation that it, to allow you the flexibility of not scheduling the trip that you can't meet. I mean, they're, they're, it makes sense. I mean, if they, if they tell you if you only can do 300 trips and you got 750 reservations, that's that's Andrew. And I think what would be helpful to that. Director Brothers, for me, let us see it. Let us see that piece of that when they say you can't do this and we can better support you. Absolutely. You know, whatever that piece is you're meeting, let us see it. Yeah, it should be it should be Yeah, yeah. 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 there's yeah. some kind of way because scheduling trips that you can't handle it's not fair to the customer. It's not fair to the customer. It's not fair to the agency. It doesn't help the situation. And if you get 750 calls, what if that's not your average number of calls? So you can't hire enough drivers to compensate for your average number of reservations. You all are bringing up the struggles. I mean, you're, you're perfectly laying out the struggle of being able to do some of that right now. But so we just need to get the information to you so you understand the regulatory mm -hmm. part of that. And we can all work together. Um, again, the, you know, the, I, I hate to sort of reiterate this, but the the SOL is just about every um, service problem facing us right now is hiring. And granted, hiring has been a challenge, but um, you know we believe that we're doing some things, particularly on, um, on the fixed route side, but for paratransit as well, we're doing some things to try to incentivize. Um, you know, hiring, but the hiring operators is the solve for service reliability. And then we have other things that are sort of um, underlying all that. Right, but for fixed route, you can determine what your staffing needs are because you're able to use a methodology to determine average number of rides, average routes, and you can do that. But if the rules are not allowing you, to have a methodology for paratransit. Right. So there's got to be something that we're missing. Well, it's a, we can forecast our paratransit demand, but, we, but then having the staffing to meet it. Yeah, see, that's, that's where the, that's the problem. The disconnect is. Yes, yeah, it's a huge right. disconnect. Yes. But I also saw the report where the, the coastal regional that contracts, so they're also missing calls. That's but they're short on drivers. Yeah, so we still have calls missing and using an outside person because I think on their report, there's missed calls. That's right. And it's the same, it goes back to the exact same thing. That's why, like I said, I, I feel like I'm, you know, I said this, but it really is, it's the key to everything to solve the job. But, you know, even, even on that report, I'm wondering, are we there, are we there, is Kat there for our? Well, I, somebody you know, else, you know. So, so when you look at that slide, Dr. Fox, uh, I believe it shows on the CRC supplemented paratransit, it shows the number of trips, it shows the scheduled trips, the actual trips. It doesn't show missed trips. I, I'll detail it if it doesn't break down and say why. CRC will have a manifest to go, and most likely when they get there, that trip is not going to happen. It could be because of to get someone, but they're not canceling that. They're not the one that's canceling. One driver trying to complete the manifest and probably running some of the same deliver of trying to get there on time. 
So on average, on the unscheduled, I don't have that answer for you. It's a good question. How would you get with my pair of pumping fun of this act with that average pipe? But shouldn't we not have any unscheduled problems? No, that's not correct. They, they have a lot of unscheduled. Why? Well, what it goes, it kind of goes back to that demand. When you have the example, you have X number of drivers, X number of passengers you can carry on the manifest of the day, but then you feel like you have an overage and they'll become unscheduled and not assigned to a particular. Operator. But they're not, it's, they're, they're not unscheduled through the system. Those people called and made a reservation. That's correct. So they are scheduled. That's correct. We just don't have a way to pick them up. Yeah. Right. So then we don't have any unscheduled. That, right. When you like that, when you say unscheduled, not like you turn it down, it's just that they have not been assigned to manifest to the bus. So everyone, the staff is understanding we need to fit that person in an available bus. Operator or a vehicle so that we can get that service. And that's so, are those people calling in the day of the ride that's needed or the day before the schedule is made? They have to call in that in advance, so they can't make same day reservation. They would have already called in. We were already had drivers, but what impacts that again is a driver call out of unforeseen something now. One example driver was scheduled, we had it on that bus, they call out. That may be 30 rides that's now unscheduled. We have to move them to another operator, to another operation. Or, and the other thing that was in um, record is we also, there is a notification that goes to the passenger that many times. Um, and even lately, because the cost of product has been repaired, is the, the other thing that we have been doing is been making Personal policy. We can have those. We don't just push out the system with the patient. The folks that work with them are going to change. We've also been prepared to accept that. Also, folks that are going to change. So, how many days do they need to call in advance? Although, if it's hours, 24 hours. 24 hours in the past. 24 hours. Yeah. And, and and the final thing that I would say is that when those unscheduled, those unseen situations come up, our call center is now, along with staff, calling these customers and saying, listen, we expect delays. And, and giving them the opportunity to say, I can reschedule. Yes. Now, the challenge to that, however, has been some of them are rescheduling, but even when they reschedule, they find themselves having that same call. Um, it is staff so that we can accommodate the number of calls. So we talked about a couple of times, well, last year, about people who have standing appointments and getting them on the schedule and having them as a permanent slot, knowing that you got to pick them up. Did we start, did we start doing that? Yes, those are what we call prescribe a, a, a so they're on there all the time. That, that doesn't change. I mean, again, the only detail will be you assign the vehicle if that operator is not available that day. Okay. Now we still do everything we can to try to accommodate that. But those are the challenges that makes it difficult that time. The term, the term on schedule. So if I was a person who would not prescribe, you know, on para transit when I had an emergency and I call them say I need a ride. Call that same day. There is yeah, you can't do that. You, it directs it. No need to take that call. Especially now that even if we could, we would say we'll see what I will do. But now there is no need to do that. I think that unscheduled probably is not the best term. Well, because they, right. they schedule yeah. they just now don't have an assignment. Right. Yeah. 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 Let me, I'm trying to bring some clarity to that because I do the system. If you schedule a ride and just say, you're a mobile call the night before, and it says you'll pick up time at nine, okay? Knowing what I know, I get up the next morning at six to make sure I still have that ride. I may or may not still have that ride. 
Now, if I don't have that ride, that goes on the unscheduled side. That means the dispatcher has to find a drive on point. So it's not really unscheduled, yeah. but you go on the unscheduled list I because you internal. already made the reservation. In that, I, I don't think you should be on the schedule. Those should be unsigned. Yeah, right. You should have, and maybe what we need to do is have a floater driver. Right. And that so we pull if the dispatcher to take over when somebody calls out. So if the dispatcher can't find you a ride due to lack of personnel, then it's a niche ride. And it, and and I know they can't help it, but they you, you don't know that you don't have a ride until that morning. So let me ask you something. When a driver on paratransit calls out, we are legally required to use paratransit. Can you pull a driver off a dock to cover that driver? We don't pull them off a dock, but what we did very recently to the best that is we um, make sure everyone talk to this, we, we pulled in supervisors and switched from folks managing the supervisor down to go drive because they were So, so and that gave us like four folks that we could put in those slots okay. in order to meet the needs. Um, and then we had to have folks who shifted into those roles because the supervisor was right. Is that, am I explaining this correctly? You're correct. But we, uh, from, we do not cut a service to provide service, but we do have, we have an opportunity to use a driver, a fixed route driver that's off that day or that was later that day, that if he or she's available, they can come in. Um, so any means necessary that we can actually get those trips to done, we do everything we can to do it. If we don't make a trip, it's because there's literally not a person there. Look at that situation. It's just, it was last week a week before, exactly like what you're describing. And we um, came together and did a, you know, did a, a thing. That was the solution that we came up with. So we're always problem solving for this right. and figuring out where those flexible assets yeah. are. Until we can get our hiring and the operator side to do it. Yeah, but I, but I, I don't think I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we cancel a dock ride. But if you took a driver, it's probably easier for you to extend a route for dock because that's a limited area than it is for you to try to. But if you're using supervisors, then that cuts it. Or using whoever we can. You know, we're, we're constantly working that and identifying who's available that we can put into these slots um, in order to be able to meet the needs. Unfortunately, you know, right now, as I said, the needs are just here and the operator shortage has impacted us right here. And so that delta between is what we're still solving for. I'm, I'm really very confident um, in, in all the things that we're doing that we're going to get there. It's just unfortunately a really some time and it is one that has also been experienced by every transit system. So. Yeah. I, I, and I just want to, um, I just want to echo that, echo what um, Ms. Becker tells on the saying is that we understand, we want staff to understand. We you know it's tough for everybody. We, yeah. we, understand, we understand that. You know, we just want to make sure that the people that we serve are getting the best service at this difficult time that SCAT can provide. That's it's, it's tough for everybody. We understand that. So please, staff, don't think that you know, we don't understand what you do. It's tough yeah, for like everybody. I, I understand it from a passenger standpoint. Um, I do take them on a daily basis. If I want to go to the gym and work out for a couple weeks, it's just tough for the drivers. It's tough for the schedule. It's tough for the dispatchers. It's tough for the supervisors right now because of the lack of personnel. So when we get back to that question about how old we have to be, I think if we take care of that, that will open up a door for us to hire personnel because 23, to me, being, being, being I'm fired in the military, I'm gonna serve my country, but I can't drop the bus after I need to get well, we're, and we're recruiting with the military now. I appreciate what you're what you're saying, Dr. Robinson, because we 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 do know and you all understand what we're expecting. You understand it extremely well. Um, and we all talk about it all the time, whether we're just talking about it in the snapshot every week or whether we're on phone calls with each other or in meetings like this. But we know that you're problem solving for us and we appreciate that. Um you know, we're doing things. I think I mentioned in one of the recent communications.
sessions by Dr. Uh, Director Taylor just mentioned the operators. This does put an additional burden on our existing operators. Um, and so our circle of care effort that we're doing is intended to give people a place to come. Mm -hmm. and just to, we're very excited about the wellness center that we just came to help address some of those things too. So understand that we're bringing all kinds of resources, but the, the solve for all of this genuinely is solving for the operator shortage. And again, that's a national, unfortunately, national experience right now. Um, and we are both on a daily basis and on a uh, organizational basis. We're looking at how to solve for that. I'm going to turn it back to Mr. Dennis and let him walk through the rest of this because there's a couple of other points in his presentation. Um, we've got that. Yeah, old drug, taken by hands and riots all over the city. I experienced that school. All my other guys were particular, but my first ride I come here was not stealing. And I I do some pretty quick due diligence in order to get ready because I never received a phone call. All of my rides, except for the one coming here, were scheduled for today. And um, my first ride, when the drop pulled up, I had no idea what time they were coming. Nobody called me this morning to let me know what time they were coming. All I knew was the meeting started at 11 o'clock. And I knew I told them to 45, and I think the driver showed up at 9 35. If she was able to give me a couple of minutes, I could have missed my ride for a reason that wouldn't have been my fault. And that happens a lot. Thank you for that. And um, we are doing our due diligence to um, make sure we ratify the situation. So, for future references, that's, I believe that's what we're talking about now. All right, Justin, so we can make that happen. And then, uh, not be out of place and everything. But the, the supervisor vehicles that y'all have now, they cannot transport wheelchairs. If you're talking about supervisor transport, they're transit. Y'all need some vehicles that can transport wheelchairs without having to pull, pull a driver that's already doing the run that may be out in the pool to come get somebody. Because if you come and get somebody from Florida and they, they got an appointment in Savannah that's been moved for a week, and then you got a person on the other side of it that has a doctor's appointment that also been moved for a week, you can not, if the driver's all, all the way in Florida, for example, I live in London. Okay, let's say I got an appointment on Elkhorn. But I live in here. You're going to call that driver all the way from Pula to come and get me because I'm on the other side of it. And this is how I go there. And the only way, the only way y'all can get more problems is to, um, because see, like I've been saying for the past, since I've been writing, kid, if you go send drivers to Pula, it needs to be two drivers out there and they need to stay in pool. They can't have the pool of Fort Woodward, Bloomingdale and all that and let all the other drivers handle everything else Because the, the pool of population is a lot smaller than the Savannah population. Mm -hmm. and Robert Coleman. And, and, and Mr. Coleman has been in meetings with us. Mm -hmm. um, um, actually, just in the last couple of weeks here, right here, Matt, and we had that come on the Atlas TV. Yeah, thank you for your input. If, if uh, you would continue on to our operating private hours, I just wanted to touch the basis on that question about hours over time. So I want to give you a couple of scenarios here if I could. So this if you can talk about a regular fixed round operator that may be working on this particular example. He or she is working that eight hour assignment that day, plus they do two hours of additional that within the 10, 10 12 rule. And they do that Monday through Friday, and they also choose to work on their two scheduled off days, the maximum hours, 10 hours each. That gives them 40 hours of regular time, 30 hours at overtime. Right. Next slide. The other 
the example would be they choose not to work additional on the scheduled days. They work the assignment to go home. They choose, they elect to work on their off days additional to um, 10 hours and they can get 20 hours at overtime, 40 hours at regular pay. Next slide would be someone who chooses only to work on their assigned day and they work eight hours plus the maximum two hours additional. They work in you know, 40 hours. 10 hours. If someone chose to max out, they could work um, 80 hours or uh, 40 hours one week and 30 hours of overtime that same week. Or in the pay period, they could work 80 hours and then 60 hours at overtime rate, giving them a total for that pay period of 140 hours. Um, and again, these are options that they have. Now, I also want to remind you that when we have proper staffing, we design our system not to automatically try to give overtime. Overtime comes about when there's a shortage of call out, but in most normal circumstances, you have enough staff that can pay each operator that they're making the penalty that guarantee 40 hours, and you have an extra board to cover up for this half, and the overtime is very minimal. But they can earn overtime now, then, at any time, if overtime is available. This is an answer. There was a question at the last meeting about this additional scenarios. So it would explain what that maximum kind of scenario is, but also what some typical scenarios can be. So overtime is still available to our operators um, under the two. Yeah. So any yeah. questions? Yeah. So um, but I guess this is more the legal. So 10 to 12 rules. I want to see that because I'm reading something different. Because you know, you know, Chatham County never played to anybody's problem. You know, and, we, and the, there's ways that we can do something about that. I just want to see what you guys are reading. Because sure. And and um, I've previously provided that um, to staff, and I'd be happy to give you a copy. Sure. sure. We're sure. glad to send it out to all of you too. It's, yeah. it's interesting too because when we had a discussion about 1012, even like the private industry here that deals with. They, they, they yeah, but, uh, but, yeah, I can just, just let me let me read. Sure, let me, sure. let me read it fully because because what I've been reading just tells me that there's some new way in there for us, but I could be missing something. Just let me see what you read. Of course, sure. okay. All right, and next, Miss um, Cutter will be delivering our financial services all the Good morning, everyone. I am going to be going over the financials for the month of September as the graph and chart on the screen uh, reflects. Uh, our revenues were um, a little less um, than our expenses for the month of September, uh, a difference being $411,612. When we look at the actual year to date in comparison to the budget, uh, we see that the differential uh, is, is minimal, uh, which tells us that um, projections are on target and it's reflective of when revenues come in and when expenses go out, but it, it typically uh, balances out uh, over the course of the year. Our revenues by CAD uh, are presented on the uh, chart. Uh, the highest uh, revenue category for the month, of course, is reflective of FTA documents at 40% of the revenue. Our expense category, uh, no surprises here. Uh, salaries and benefits making uh, a huge percentage of expenses for the month. 
<laughs> our cash receipts, actual monies received, um, Chatham County, the special district tax, $111,107. Our paratransit funds, that's an amount set that we receive uh, each month. And at the year end, it is reconciled for any overages or shortages. The per occupied road fees for the month came in at $63,402. And our federal grant assistance for the month totaled by $27,828. If you note the language in red, I've been speaking of this for about a year and a half. Um, the grant has been executed. Uh, this is the uh, FY21 grant. Uh, we anticipate going down uh, $3.8 million in reimbursement uh, dollars. Um, and, and these are monies that we have been waiting uh, to go into the uh, reserve account to prepare us for uh, bleak periods. Uh, to help us with uh, capital matches uh, and unexpected expenses that may occur. In addition, our goal for the reserve fund is three months of the operating budget, which for Chatham uh, area transit, uh, that's close to a little over a million dollars. Our operating cash balance at the end of September 30 was $5,949,178. Calling your attention to this last month, that balance was seven point nine. Within a month, we're down two million. So we're seeing that um, monies are gone. When we see that half now it's one month, something the next month comes in um, and, and keeps that. Also remind you that that general operating uh, fund should always be at a minimum, at a minimum of two months of operating uh, expenses. Okay, this, this is what it looks like. Passenger fares are up, tells us that more people are riding the bus. The agency revenue is up, and that's pretty much the dot shuttle uh, paratransit. The transit tax uh, is down, and that's just driven by when people pay their taxes. Uh, our grant revenue is 3% um, low pro below projection, and the other revenues are, are up. Um, the expenses. Uh, salaries and wages, everything you know, and that's because of uh, uh, position vacancies primarily. Benefits, you, you can tell the categories that are up and those categories that are low. Uh, fuel is down and the cost of su supplies and materials are also I wanted to begin to show you um, the actual versus projected so you get a feel as to what the projections look like in comparison to um, the projection. So this is what uh, this graph uh, tell you. Um, for the month of September, uh, it tells you that the actual was a little less than what was projected. I spoke briefly about the operating reserves um, and I will be bringing forward an, an action item report for the board to uh, consider moving uh, the $3.8 million so that will be forthcoming and it's contingent upon the timing that the federal government actually puts the money uh, into our. Georgia, the Georgia Investment Fund, we 
is our reserve fund. That's the other money that's going to see if it's stored. Yes. So that, <coughs> yes. And we have seven point eight million dollars. Yes. And remember, we should always have that money. That sorry, we should for more, but we should always at least have that in reserve. So what is that? Is it in the county? Yes, it is. Do we have? I mean, this is the now, but what are the what's the context of us using that money? I do have a policy, and it's. It can be used for to cover operating shortfalls. It could be used to cover a capital local match. Uh, it can be used to cover an emergency repair and or um, uh, security. And one of the things you know that we aren't having for this kind of help with that too is you know we are we are really using this reserve policy in the operating grocery sales. Um, as um, our plan cover and as potential fiscal cliff that all of those systems can have the other thing we were talking about why we such a strong reduction of um, as well as um, some of these other things that are described up here that we were actually um, in the first Now, what 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 helps us to really stay on on top of things? Um, we are being very diligent um, with controls in our financial operating systems. Um, when um, different divisions go beyond what is budgeted, um, it stops. You know, just can't move unless there is a justifiable reason to spend outside of your budgeted uh, allocation. Uh, we are getting ready to get back into the FY24 budget process already. Um, we're starting early, uh, being very diligent about that. That is, we are encouraging all managers to be good uh, stewards over resources that have been allocated to them. So it's ongoing and it's continuous. And we are also preparing um, and, and issuing monthly uh, budget reports to departments so they know exactly where they are in every category. Uh, what's coming? Bobby. Ford, I can't hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody answer your phone. <laughs> the the auditor will be um, coming before the board to present uh, the outcome of the uh, fiscal year 22 audit uh, next month. Uh, union negotiations will resume um, next month. And of course, that's going to significantly uh, impact the budget and outcome of that. Uh, the RFP for the responses to the RFP for on-call services um, was was very uh, productive, and, and those that recommendation will be coming before the board. The uh, RFP for the ferry boat construction it closes the end of this month, and we look forward to seeing what those proposals look like. Now, this this slide is currently under review. Uh, listening to some of your concerns as to the information uh, you would like to see is going to be incorporated uh, on the slide to include the comings, the goings, the vacancies, and you'll have that uh, at next week's board. It is work in progress. 
it's one thing I want to be sure this paper mentions that we can go back to slide for the board hearing was is that the bid that is due. You may recall we briefed the board previously on uh, issues that um, that we were experiencing with that particular the ferry boat award between the grant award that we were given, the construction estimates that we had for those, we recall it was a significant difference because there was a great lag in time between the technical grant and the current supply chain materials cost and all those issues. Um, we were very successful and deeply appreciative um, at that, that Pretty dramatic cost differential that we have there on those ferries. Uh, both the county and the convention center came forward with significant match contributions to help largely um, fill that um, that deficit that we were experiencing there. So I wanted to be sure that we were aware of that. When I saw that, go back to the last slide. Just I was kind of um. Just a point that it would be interesting to have a slide because what I was looking for is just some idea. And because when he showed me zero in September, I was looking for it. It may not be completed, but I was looking for something on that slide. Okay. And um, because one of the concerns that, that I have, that I think that we as a board need to see, is um, you guys do exit any deal. Uh, Dr. Robinson, in response to that, we have a new HR manager and in the process of training her. So with the data, um, I have it now. Mm -hmm. It just didn't come in the time for me to get it on the report to go through it um, and to add some things. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you will have it. Matter of fact, um, I'll work on it to get it to you prior to on um, board meeting so you can have it and kind of say if there's any additional information you want captured but but that's pretty much um, recently there are no stats we are in the process of training uh, getting some things caught up and and i just don't like to um, put numbers out there and i'm not comfortable with them so i'd rather wait until I have time to actually um and really I meant to, to, to take it out, but I didn't want you all to think that um it was being uh, ignored and, and felt that I could explain it in person. Are you going to add HR? Yeah. That's yes, yes. I will. And, and also, again, again, I, as a board member, I, I really, because I just think that somehow we can help in the city effort, but I'd like to see why people are leaving, you know, what are they saying when they leave the city? I just think, see, I think that there should be some kind of uh, legacy that I can follow. You know, I've got a I've 19 year old son or an 18 year old son. And, all he wants to do is drive a bus. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be able to say, you know, go to cat, you know. So I just like to see why people are leaving and And I, I also want I'm going to include the recruitment efforts. I'm going to include the applications in progress. Uh, because okay. a, a lot of times, you know, the pre employments take a while because the labs are backlogged. And, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get as much information uh, as I can so you all don't have to try to figure out what's going on. The numbers are being uh, presented to me in conference. And train your HR person because you have a lot yes. of work for the district finance and loans. So. That's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so and she, she's, she's the, that, that team, uh, we hired the uh, filled the, the last position. Um, the young lady started uh, on Monday, so so the team uh, and they're working uh, well together, and, and you're going to see the results of that. The other thing too, they were having with an HR is that HR is on the temporary. <laughs> Um, what we did, as you recall, is that on the what will be the duties that fall under the chief administrative officer, which were pretty close on that file, uh, we divided them up and I took half and this yeah. took half 
and then I took the plane and she got the finance. And so we were working <coughs> uh, things out as we're starting to fill positions that alignment of those duties so that the, the real um, direction and management, you know, without having to do so much to go over. I think vetting good employees, you know, take time to you know. I want you guys to be the best, you know. I don't, you know, because I don't want you to do this over and over again. So, um, but just, you know. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Did, did we um, last of this meeting, two or four years or so, ask if we had checked with Charleston on the start of the We yeah. did, we sent that out to you um, in a, um, like one of the snapshots, like two, maybe I think it's maybe two weeks ago, because we said, look at these numbers that are at, there's a lot here to think about, a lot of impact, and it's Charleston and some other areas. Mm -hmm. And so what Beverly uh, did the research on that, and part of the reflection of that is what you're going to see in what we're going to suggest bringing forward today in the sign agreement for, um, for operators. And so. yeah. there's, I don't think we've done a federal survey. See if our people are making what they're supposed to make since 2017. No, we just concluded at this point. Uh, we, uh, about the time that, that I came here, we were in progress and it was recently completed. I will tell you that it's interesting though when you get those, uh, that uh, class study um, that was done and you see some of the information we're getting after, like on operator status and that kind of thing. And you go to the conferences and you're speaking to your peers and you're asking, well, what did you pay X on the exposition? And sometimes those, we still find that the competitiveness, um, other, other places are out there on the social services, even all of that over information. And that's not so ignoring it. Obviously, all of those are good data points that we need to draw upon. But we do have a couple of work. Absolutely opposite. Yes, um, Last thing on the on the committee reports, and I think this is maybe more for Ariel. The um, uh, one thing I'd like to see in, in the reports are the number of people signed up for the text message, but also in context of the month before, the year before, um, and then also how many people are using the app downloads you can share how many times it's open on the phone. Uh, that'd be cool to see too. And the other one was, I think that was the only two I had. I might have more and I'll talk about these later, but I think because they're just, they're just such powerful people are using the cat tracker app and using the text messages that they're, they're pretty much up to speed of what's going on at cat. And that's so wonderful. I did add the, um, Download that check out, have the app that we will create. That's fine. Well, I'll go listen to what you did. Well, thank you for all that. Um, and we're going to go now to the planning and infrastructure development update. Ashley, you want to this report? <laughs> Average in December, September is slightly down from the last month of August. However, all route KPI holds similarly. We want to point out the route 27 waters with a 50.8% increase to 15.9 passenger per hour KPI for this month. We want to point out the Route 31 getaway with a 52.7% increase year over year to 16.0 and passengers per hour KPI. We also want to point out our uh, routes such as 3D, 14, and the 17. The 17 so far as a passenger per hour both at 4 at 28.5%. These passenger per hour increases uh, have been pretty steady year over year through the spring and summer quarters through to the fall. Uh, however, we will see small fluctuation changes as we have started to utilize our APC certified data sets. These numbers will start to tighten up a little bit as we look at our uh, service hours and reliability. Something I'll mention on this article today, the next is on the uh, 14.7 and 28 hour for the water 
do a, a follow up tomorrow. You may recall at our last meeting, um, we had reported that students are in the, um, the meeting that was around the uh, transit signal prioritization projects in the quarter. We do have to see this in there and have to be delayed. We want to do it tomorrow at GDOT on the market and that information being reported. Cat call service temporary modifications. Ready for action item approval this month regarding city agreement for bus stop improvements on State Route 41 for the Route 3 bus channel. Cat planning has been working with the uh, Cat Master Transit Partners planning implementation strategies and kick off for the previous month. Uh, TDP CLA operations analysis is ongoing as we are working through the fall uh, service modifications. We also, uh, at the end of today's meeting, have a presentation for me from the regional floor MPO for the 23 Metropolitan Transportation Program, uh, which is a long term regional funding process here for Savannah Chatham County. Next slide, please. We are excited to bring forward to you the Garden City Agreement. Um, we are hoping to improve six bus stops on State Route 21. It's a 1.7 mile corridor uh, in conjunction with Garden City and GDOT. Each bus stop will be full of amenities and shelter improvements, as well as ADA accessibility. And we have also, uh, in the agreement, provided for a small operating cost of annual expenses. Thank you, Mayor also Garden City is also committed to the cost of this response process and incremental operational costs, and they're making a direct contribution. And well, when I saw that particular paragraph, I, I guess the only question I had when you said uh, this will include an annual cost agreement, can we put the numbers free to that? Yes, ma'am. It's in the agreement. Um, there'll be, it's in the agreement and in the action item that uh, we're going to present later, and it'll have to be, it is for this year. We thank your packet for this video goods update. Uh, we expect to update the tables in December of 2022 in conjunction with CAP Finance at the core MPO for our Z950 carry funding as well as our Z250 interstate um, road flex funding for the 307. Um, the tables themselves at the MPO are updated by amendment uh, on a bi monthly basis. And these tables, uh, at least on a quarterly to uh, twice a year basis, have a full uh, tables update. Um, we expect to request in the October TCC meeting later this week uh, for a, a full tables uh, document update that the MPO. Uh, again, provides every so often throughout the year. But containing your packet today is are the updates that we have taken to uh, core MPO from February, April, June, and then to October this month. Okay, next slide is an update for our micro transit and first mile, last mile implementation. CAP staff is to continue to come on board as we are working through our TDP CLA operations analysis and ridership data. Uh, we have been working with our consultants with WRA as well as Nelson Nagar with the National Transit Plan uh, to look at uh, how, we, how we, as CAT, uh, bring on board a new operational mode. Um, this operational mode still uh, requires continuing work with procurement finance and both the procurement process and uh, financial budget. And we are working still on the amenities database uh, to fine tune the areas in which a micro transit mode could be adaptable for our transit system here at CAP. Uh, a piece of micro transit to that staff is considering to think about is the dynamic routing, as well as shared rides and ridership pickup or drop off, as well as the technology required to request by phone and mobile app. Uh, Microtransit does uh, come into uh, our already outstanding technology improvements, and, and how do we 
um, managed to collaborate and work all of those things together while providing uh, a new mode of high services. That would be software that you would lease and not purchase? We could do either. Um, and, and a bit of this is that our, our, existing, our existing software service, such as our paratransit service, um, the paratransit software can be adapted to fit on demand microtransit service. However, given that uh, where we are in the useful life and asset management of the paratransit service, uh, a bigger piece to this puzzle is also to look at um, how do we how do we make sure that both our current services are being provided for as well as what a potential new service would be. But one of the issues that we had two CEOs ago was that we had been purchasing software. Purchasing software outlives its usefulness in at least maybe a total of three years. And the conversation was that we were going to switch to licensing, want to use a licensing software, but bring the server in-house and have the server backed up in-house and on the cloud instead of not having the server. So typically what we're doing, typically what we're doing now, one, we're trying to migrate away from server-based and then we go to cloud-based um, management and storage and all that sort of thing, just because that's a really potential modern way as what most systems are doing. The other piece of this is, um, in terms of microtransit, because microtransit is a part of the whole uh, mobility as a service um, family, uh, MOS family. Um, how ultimately we deploy microtransit here and the technology that manages it um, is likely to be embedded in the service um, and could be a part of the, uh, how we provide it as a service versus it's going to be a standalone thing until we get to this uh, point with the master transit plan and we begin to think about how, what is the future. Um, what does our future fixed route system look like to have micro transit zones that can encompass all the county in front of that? And then that's a little different. But it's a, it's a business system evaluation that we're going to need to make at the time that's to the very points that you're uh, describing, Director, of how we do it. And we would need to bring that back to the board and present those options and look at it from a pure business perspective and figure out those. But again, with micro transit, it's a little bit more embedded in the service versus sort of a standalone. If we get the right software, we'll be able to pull reports from it instead of generating that. One of the things that I just asked for, unrelated to micro transit specifically, but related to what you're talking about, is I have asked our IT innovation manager this week to do a complete comprehensive evaluation of all of the software sort of hardware in that innovation and technology um, asset management um, operations delivery space look at everything we've got and figure out so everything's like over and things and all these pieces of parts figure out how's it right match how's it all fitting together or not um, and where do we have gaps um, that we need to fill, or where do we have duplication that we need to eliminate? But we need to look at that comprehensively because we have lots of things. And how is it, it's, some, it's unclear to me sometimes at first right now, how are we making sure it's all fitting together and it's efficient? And they communicate to each other. Absolutely. But now, if you go strictly cloud, then you're going to do remote desktop? Not necessarily. That's I'm sorry, that's not this no, committee. No, no, no. That's, <laughs> that's something I would, I would need to have more of an IT innovation on the okay. map, but we want to migrate away from a server sort of based system to more of a file based system. Next slide, please. Oh, one other quick thing. I'm sorry for that real quick. I wanted to be sure, uh, actually, I wanted to be very transparent and clear with you. Some months ago, I think even before um, I got here, but since I've been here as well, we had, I think, on a couple of occasions, a very famous fortune scene. It, it had been indicated that this would, would be great for implementation. Of this year? Yes, ma'am. 
Um, we actually have a couple of memos out to you that said that it will not. Um, and I want to be clear about that. There's some, as, as Ashley mentioned, there are still some procurement matters that have to be resolved on how we do this and so forth that are going to take a bit more time. So this is this is a 2023 um, activity and investment. But I wanted to be clear that for those who might go back and read those memos and go, wait a minute. I thought, I thought they said something that this is November. I just wanted to be concerned. We're, we're, we're going to be a little bit beyond that. Day. So are you, are you thinking this is a nine-month project? Uh, I think it depends on exactly what we end up doing with it and how we, you know, we, we had to resolve the entrance issues early and now that Now we've got to resolve the procurement of it um, and how that occurs. And that's going to take a little bit. I don't think it'll be a nine, nine months. Once you pick, the, once you go through the procurement and you pick the software, then you got to implement it, then you got to train on it, and then you got to launch it. So that's probably 90 days for that end. So we're going to do procurement and you'll keep the RFP open for 30 days or 45. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the procurement is Sort of that early in the process, and that's all we're going to do. Are you going to be able to? Are you going to have to be have to upgrade the current software to last until, or will it hold out until you finish? The current software that we have, the current software. I think I, I just mentioned to you the evaluation that we have going on in all right. of our software. Right. Well. So I think that that is a question mark. Software that we currently have one serving us in all the ways we need for you know, getting the customer service we need. Is it, is it meeting all of our objects? Is it working together and what we need to do in the right system? And once we determine all that, then all of these different services might be able to figure out how that. But I don't think we have any issues.
So um, we do not have a, a proposed action item under the service for the operational committee, but under financial services, I would like to join us. Um, and we've got three um, very important The first item is a side letter agreement between CAT and ATU with regard to proposed salary increases in the They basically, um, this action item. That's the the primary purpose of moving forward with a side letter of agreement. Um, as I mentioned early, early union negotiations began um, next month, but I think everyone realizes and understands that getting back in uh, is a great urgency uh, working in conjunction with Dr. Payne. Um, I felt that this uh, is the proper way to go uh, for this to be 23. Um, it is affordable and it is affordable uh, primarily due to uh, salary savings in addition to and looking at through fiscal year 23 budget, um, months were already out in the core um, for uh, unionized uh, personnel. Um, the analysis revealed that the additional cost to uh, implement this proposal is projected at a little over $18,000 for a period. Uh, covering uh, three, about three point five uh, pay periods, and it covers uh, the period October twenty third through November twenty seventh of. I'd like to make a recommendation, Chairman, if I may. I'd like to this item at the end. I I think it's worth discussing and having a closed and putting on the question. I'd like to see that one. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any questions or comments on today? I don't. I just don't think that. Just to be sure, as Ms. Cutter just described, we want to be sure it's clear that there have been savings that have been accrued because they are being budgeted for those salary increases and then the uh, union ratification would follow. There were savings both on this, on that side, and on vacancies that have been accrued that largely um, cover this. Um, with this, um, the exception of that $18,000. So it's not a whole year over the cost. But I don't think we're, I don't think any of us would be opposed if we need more money to pay driver. Right. Very good. Or, or if we are, after the salary survey is complete, that there's some salaries that need to be raised so that they are making a comparable wage versus people who are in comparable position. I don't think anybody would be opposed to bringing that back to us. Yes. So we can vote for it. Do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is this going to be enough to pay your Right. It, this puts us in a really peer, strong peer position to other operators in the area, as well as to what is happening nationally. Yeah. We're very pleased with, with this proposal. Directly in competition with the school board. And, so, and the school board is willing to pay whatever they got to pay. Like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but I'd like to have it. Yeah. If everybody else agrees, I think it's a good idea. The next is the uh, operating reserve um, fund tax. I, I spoke uh, briefly about that uh, in the presentation, uh, and I wanted to move forward with. Yes. Was approved to move. However, 
and we won't occur until that money actually hits the account. And I didn't want to further delay placing in an investment account. We have some major uh, capital expenses uh, coming up for us, and we need to safeguard those dollars in order to uh, pay how uh, it's time. And then the other is the emergency repair for Susan King Taylor. That action item will be coming before the board as well for next week for approval with the detailed report on uh, what the uh, actual costs and repairs are to uh, that area. That's and on that other report, we only have one carry on. Yes. Yes. Yeah, as we see here today, there's two that are in for repairs. Yeah. 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 We're investing a lot right now into those existing vessels to ensure that they do stay in the same and water worthy uh, consideration of our, you know, ability for the next couple of years. So but we, we, we are now nearly always this morning we have a conversation about well, alternatives that may need to be in place, for example. Couple of major events are coming in for a minute. Rather than waiting for having something happen, you're making offer the arrangements to engage prior trolley services to help ensure reliability service. Or in certain cases, for example, we'll have conversations about offering a bus bridge um, in that kind of way that gets both to and from. So, um, but I think we're all, we all at least are in a strong partnership now on a level of understanding of the situation. And we're all working together to get through this next couple of years until we can deliver those ferries and get some better situations. We're fail to the dock. They can't be fail to the dock. Everything on both the Docks that are planned and repairs are both underway and doing well right now. Making progress. Yeah. Yeah. No. no. What we would do in that case is we would offer a, um, if it was something that we, we needed to do, that would be too critical. We would do an offer of a bus bridge or a railway service that would offer that service. And um, but what's happening with our our partners that we mentioned center too is they budget for things like that as well. Um, and so and travel our business business budget for things like that as well. So they're they're looking at probably options for folks that are just doing that. Any other questions? And the next item is a part of the presentation that I'll go over with you now. And Dr. Robinson, I'll make sure mention those costs that the Garden City Intergovernmental Agreement was um, adopted by the City of Garden City. Um, what it contains is their commitment to um, the estimated $20,000 per stop, six stops, $110,000 for the capital cost. And then an additional amount though, we estimated for this first year of, of operations, uh, just over $18,000 in increased operational costs. Because keep in mind, we're already running service there, so it's the actual stops that add to that additional. That would need to be reevaluated on a basis because things like fuel or whatever might change that as a new force. But nonetheless, uh, that was a really strong commitment to the city of our city to bring that fully into. So now we're ready to go on both sides of the street. Yes. And well, that's correct. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we we program three um, basically there's three major points in the section of the route that we don't currently provide Garden City service. And each of those 
three locations have bus stops on both sides of the street, so a total of six stops. A major component to this will be, of course, the new growth high school and all the construction. And then there's a focus uh, at a location a little bit north of that and a little bit south of that. They're evenly spaced through the through the 1.575 mile corridor, um, where we basically we come through the portion of Garden City that is in our tax district. There's a portion outside of the tax district, and then as you get to the airport area, you're back in our tax district. Okay. So, two questions: the twenty thousand per stop that will include the pouring of the concrete for. Uh, what area or is it just going to be the that's the pad, the shelter, the solar, the waste receptacle, and the bench? That's what I want to say. It's a complete sort of, it doesn't include all of the like, sidewalk infrastructure up to it, it includes the pad and an ADA accessible pad. Mm -hmm. They are um, uh, Garden City committed to doing the pedestrian infrastructure. Okay, but the 20 will, will get us shelters and everything. Solar line. And that train is, is, you know, there's a whole lot of other things going on that could impact all. So the on time performance on the Route 3 is um, it's actually not too bad. Um, it's on time. It's on time is meeting the average for the majority of our routes. So when you see this 57, 60% of the way, that's about what the route thing is doing. Um, it's running late right now, about 31% of the time. Um, we also, as part of the fall, um, before, before we really start talking about the service modifications, but just about all service changes, um, we had some timing updates to the three both to accommodate the airport bus stop on the inbound, but also we were looking at how that the Route 3 is getting all the way out to Bending Highlands and coming back in. And some of that on-time performance is also from a segment-to-segment segment review where if it's getting a little too ahead of itself and then it's kind of getting out there, or if it's coming in behind, wait. And then that fluctuation on-time performance, it, it can also matter for, say, afternoon, like when school gets out, or in your morning traffic periods as well. So um, we'll continue to evaluate that once the new service schedule is in place. And I, I did have another question because I've gotten some calls. You know, I, in the fifth district, they expanded down Little Neck Road past, you know, down off 17, all the way behind I 95. They just incorporated that. That's now city. And are, are we required to go there because that city is we're supposed to provide service to the city but they've gone out there and incorporated that and it is what three four hundred apartments in the end now so what i would say is that as part of our master transit plan implementation strategies that's something that we're looking at because recent annexations um, they occur on an annual basis. Um, if you look at that with our tax district uh, back through the uh, tax assessor and, and that annual process to budget review. Um, the master transit plan and our, our TDPCOA is, is, the, is the right opportunity to look at that and then we'll be able to provide the service analysis say, if you were to make these extensions, this is what it would do to affect your current routing or we can program it into it's term uh, future one. Well, any of these things that are we're going to talk about this process. It's one of the things we're going to be discussing. We've got to really be very um, right about putting forward the system that we're going to provide, the large provider that we're going to provide, uh, that we are matching the funding part. So, you know, see the county and we can talk about legislative agenda and so forth. We can start with a very, um, you know, aggressive in a good kind of way. 
about making sure that we're thinking about those things. We're not just making services exchanges. We're just having to talk because we're the partnerships and other partnerships. Do you think that we can touch base with the builders that are building a warehouse extension? Do you know out there off the road? The old area that used to be uh, Keller Farms, the building, what, 300? Three that is we're, we're working with the city already, and I'll reach back out there. But we, we've had uh, two meetings already. Um, so that things like stocks and those kinds of things can be incorporated into developments that will be permitted of the worker developers and that they'll be considered. So I think those things um, made a presentation to the companies and so forth. So we're starting to be more uh, active in that area. And I think that's a good point in that particular way. I think the bills would be cooperative because they've agreed they agreed to build part of the roadway to get into the infrastructure. Yes, ma'am. You are you were on deck. All right. Um, uh, talk for just a minute about the service reliability modifications we talked about at the last meeting. I'm going to share some of the same information, but I'm also going to provide some update as to where we are. Go ahead to the next slide. Most important about the uh, uh, tr our transit service is we really make a uh, promise to our customers that we're gonna connect them to opportunities, will be time competitive, affordable, we'll operate all our scheduled service, we'll be on time, we respond quickly, and we're friendly operators. Unfortunately, that's not the situation that we're in right now with, with such a shortage. When we're providing our uh, uh, transit dispatching, we wanna make sure that we provide the same uh, operator on the same bus every day, we have enough extra operators to provide for late six and service interruptions. And typically we wanna make sure that we have enough staff for uh, um, progressive discipline as well as retraining. Go ahead to our next uh, slide, please. This was a slide that I shared with you before for August uh, of this year and shows the number of hours missed by day of the week. Um, we reached as high as 40 hours missed on any particular uh, day. And this was even with operators working all kinds of additional overtime, 12 and a half percent of your work in August was uh, by overtime. Go to the next slide. Well, things really got worse in September. This is from your operating reports, the number of um, hours that we actually missed in September. And quite candidly, I think we turned from being a service that folks might be able to rely on to being especially unreliable in the late afternoons. I'm sure we had stranded and frustrated customers and we also had exhausted employees. It is really because of this level of missed hours and missed service that we're having to make the service modifications that we have at, uh, proposed. Go to the next one. Now, uh, the CAT service reliability plan really first focused on continuing to hire and recruit new operators. Mr. Ritchie? Uh, Yes. Jim, can you type just a minute? We had a, one of our directors had a, a question, sir. Okay, great. Let's back up then. Are you talking about fixed routes and paratransit? No, this is just fixed route. Okay. 
Thank you. Just to extract, and one of the things that when, when uh, Mr. Richie mentioned, um, you know, that dramatic shift, that was also, and that was reflected in the communications report as well. One of the things we did during that period of time was we outreached down to ICC and spent a lot of time out on the uh, platform there just talking about it. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, our basic plan first really starts with continuing to aggressively hire new operators. And I know that uh, the whole operations team is really focused on hiring new operators. Unfortunately, beginning October the 31st, we're going to have to suspend some unproductive routes and trips, and we've targeted to affect the least number of riders. Now, our goal is by March of next year, your next uh, general service pick, is to maybe look at some other service changes, of course, that come back to the board for review and comment and thought. But hopefully by next March, we can have some service changes that not only restore the services that we've reduced, but maybe have some new opportunities as well. Now, over on the right-hand side of the screen just shows the comparison of the services that we had in March of 2022, when we scheduled a total of 2,745 hours to what we're going to be going to on October the 1st for November of 2022. And so this is, we're, we're cutting roughly 455 hours a week. 17% of the service. This is enough to really cover for about 12 bus operators. But I believe with this service change, we'll be able to, uh, to return to more reliable um, service. Can you stop there for a minute? We have a director with a question, sir. Okay. Two slides to the, uh, the really scary slide. Yeah, that one. The other one. Nope, other way, there we, one more, there you go. Yeah, that one, let me just, uh, just these are missed hours per month. Yes, this is the total for the month that were missed. Okay, and then go to the slide we're on now. And so, so we're really cutting roughly uh, 1,700 hours, um, maybe 1,800 hours for the uh, for the month. Okay, got it. That's what. I was and uh, if you go back to the other slide, actually, it matches up reasonably well with the number of hours that was actually missed. Thanks. Okay, keep going. One more. All right, so. What were our, I'm, go back one more, I'm sorry. Our ground rules were um, that we used to try to make the service changes was to focus first on reductions where we have the least ridership. We wanted to emphasize reductions on low ridership routes, segments, and trips. In some cases, routes were close enough that people could walk between routes and so we could reduce some service duplication. But we didn't want to make wholesale route alignment changes at this point. And we also wanted to focus to maintain service to um, low income and minority uh, populations. So the next slide shows three routes that we propose to totally suspend for the time being. Now, these routes might be able to be returned if we get additional operators um, hired, but that's Route 4, Route 11, and Route 20. Now, I want to point out to you the cost per ride on these routes currently. This is a total cost per ride, including all of your administrative and overhead expenses. Now, for Routes 4 and 11, 
there are alternatives within reasonable walking distance of these routes. For Route 20, there is not. Uh, but it's also relatively few riders that are on Route uh, Route 20. We've now, question, we've yes. This is more staff because Route 20 is your coffee bluff route. You know, that's a low ridership, but also you have 31. So what are we doing to ensure that those riders can connect? If you're not going to coffee bluff, and I understand it's few riders, but those are working people out there. So, you know, all these numbers look great, but I'm concerned about the impact of having those folks need that service. So I think we need to find a way, and you also have the board. No, so you find. I just need you to tell me what's going to happen to those people when they do. If, if, if I can push back on that, I think there's no good option. I mean, that's just that's the. Well, that's you the, the, well, the option is your own call. It's it just I think, but we're like we don't have what I picked up is we just can't. There are a pair of that's possible. We can say that we can't. We can say that, but again. I just want to reiterate, we got working for this guy to get the work. And I can't, so I'm thinking that I'm just asking staff, let's find a way. I think that there's going to be some challenges, just being honest with you. Oh, we know that, yeah. But I think there's going to be some challenges with some of that. But I do want you to know that we are, as I've stated over and over, we are going to be very mindful of this. And it's hiring operators hurting all of this around. We are going to be very mindful of those folks that are that are actually impacted by suspensions. Um, of course, with the 40 and 11, we've got all the amounts. 20 is the one, right. although um, a really low level of ridership. Not to say that everyone's not important, but that cost per ride is really a pretty dramatic cost per ride in other countries, too. So, um, I mean, I think that there's some things here. I think I think there's some short term things with the notion that we've got to again this is a short term situation. We've got to get operators, we've got to get service out of that, but we've also got to get some master transit plan over time. You know, what does the system do that can operate more efficiently and effectively and meet the needs of everyone who's trying to get to jobs in the places they need to go? They let, let us back up a couple of slides, please. One more, there we go. What this slide really shows is for 1400 hours during September, your customers were expecting a bus to show up and pick them up. And they were left sitting at the bus stop wondering when they were gonna get home or how they were gonna get home. And so, that's really what we're trying to fix is so that we know we're going to inconvenience and we're going to disrupt the routine of a number of customers, but at least they're going to know it's going to be predictable. Yes, Route 20 won't operate any longer until we can get bus operators to put it back, but you won't go out and stand at the bus stop hoping your bus will show up and it never comes. It's really returning service to reliability that's the whole purpose of this uh, of this change. Um, and that's the uh, that does mean that we're picking the the places that we've got to make service reductions. And it looks like there was a question. Yes, sir. Um, my question is, what kind of um, safety parameters were thought about when you move in these routes, because all right, the time is getting ready to change. And you're gonna lose two hours of daylight time. That young lady that's coming from school, that senior citizen that's coming from work, you remove those routes and they have to walk a little distance. So us is not a good thing. But to them it could be dangerous. Especially at six, six thirty, um, no matter where these routes are. You're talking about removing routes and people having to take an alternate route that could be a little distance for them according to where they get off the first bus or the second bus off they're walking to. And again, 
at six o'clock in about a month, it's going to be dark. And so you have people that's transferring or walking to these routes that the reason why these routes were put in place, and I understand, you know, is because they were convenient for us. So now we're taking them away, but we're saying it's convenient for us. I, I don't really understand. I, I, if, if I can, if I can, if I can comment on that, I think it's for, for both the people that you're bringing up, um, they'll know now that there's this reliable service for their head. Right now, they, we don't know. I, I can't tell you. I mean, we, we, it's, there's a 50 50 chance the bus is going to be there for, for them in the evening or not. And I think what we're trying to do is that there's a there's a 95% chance with these modifications in place that the bus will be there. It's just, I mean, that's, but, that's, that's a very Yes, exactly. At the cost of, of, no, I'm talking about money. Yeah, same here. I'm, 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 I'm talking about a human life after six o'clock. I think the question is a little more about when we do these things, have we actually done a customer impact survey? Do we say we care about the customer? I don't think I think, I think money, saving money is great. You know, I think we need to do money, but I just think that there should be more conscious awareness. Of how this really, really impacts the people we hope to serve. So I would like to say one thing about all that. So I'm just trying to point out, first of all, this is none of this is about saving money. I want to be really clear about that. Absolutely none of this is about saving money. What this is about is that right now we are stranding drivers in all kinds of inconvenient ways. And we are going to continue to do it unless we make changes. Because we can't keep running the system as it is with the operator levels that we have and be reliable. It's simply unavailable. And I would, I would also suggest that reliability is a measure of safety. I completely appreciate Director Sawyer's comment about the time change and the, the, the dark and those, those particular routes where you're going to be catching in an alternate. I think that we certainly are, are glad to. Um, and enhance the sort of safety practices and so forth um, to be mindful of that. The last thing I would say is remember that slide that we showed at the very beginning about the amount of outreach that we have done. Um, you know, so temporary service mods actually are in, in the FDA world are also referred to as emergency service mods. That's really how we need to look at this with that level of The liability to a brand, the liability to tax, your eligibility for federal funding, the liability, this, this level of approval liability does lots of things, um, that none of which are good. So I think that that's why we would, we are bringing this forward as something that's absolutely essential for us to get in place and get in place quickly as an emergency temporary measure while we're mindful of all those things and the outreach that we've already done, which has pushed a lot of information out in all kinds of different ways, that we would continue that as we've said all along, that would be continued throughout the duration of this temporary service model. We're going to keep talking to people all the way through and adding service back, even if it's in small increments, as best we can through that. Or not, for the record, or not, we may not add service back. So although we call them temporary, there's some permanency in what I'm hearing. And that can change. Well, no, there, this is a temporary service line. This is a temporary emergency service line. And as we can, if we hire operators, I'm going to say that really quickly, as we can hire operators and add service back, we will do so. The master transit plan affords us the opportunity to look at our overall system and our network and our routes and determine Moving forward in the future, just because this route system is in place right now, things are changing. We've got growth in the community. We've got perhaps some population shifts and employment shifts. And so our system needs to grow and accommodate that as well. And so the notion that we'll be looking at this system to do those kinds of things and make sure we're serving people from the very best of our will be in place as well. Also, when, yep. when the survey was being done, did they survey any of the passengers? That's going to be affected by this. So I'm trying to we we have we have talked to passengers, but we've done it in a more one-on-one -on -one kind of basis. We've we've passed out information, we've met folks um 
at the ITC on the platform. We, we've done those kinds of things and we have pushed the information out. And obviously, you know, we know directly that there are one of the people who are impacted by this who aren't going to be happy with it. It's still the right thing to do because of the dramatic service for liability issue. It is profound and dramatic and it means we're really doing a poor job. May I say something? Yes. I mean, I know this is not good for any of us to hear and experience, but right now we're at a critical point by looking at these graphs and we're going to have to do something. And this is why I hope in the future that we can look at something like this first mile, last mile that could get the, the smaller routes that are not being utilized as much to the more popular routes. But for now, I don't think we have a choice. I do think that as we look to the master present plan, especially the sort of focus we have around how do we really um, build up the quality of our fixed route system and expand, we'll actually serve more people with a, a, an expanded micro transit zone system and more deeply into the community and with much stronger equity. Um, and that's the direction that we're taking our whole system in with the Master Transit Plan. And I think that's going to uh, make my comments that you just made the record show. So, how many extra drivers will we have? It's not extra drivers. We're matching the service we're going to provide to the drivers that we have. There are no extra drivers. That's it. We're what it is is we don't have enough drivers to meet the services here and the drivers are here so now right. what we're doing is we're okay. bringing the service here so that those two things match and that's where we get the reliability so we're removing these routes not extra drivers how many drivers would that free up to go to another route so to, to, to kind of explain what it, it doesn't necessarily free up routes go to other routes so what we have said that those drivers that's just who are have not been listed in action those trips that did we go the ones who are currently here will actually make the trip that we were saying so if you eliminate the missed trips happy to must cover the missed trips now extra drivers it just says that you move your work so the number of drivers that you have um, what it says that that's we that hire more drivers, then you're able to look back and say, can we now put a bus out there and provide some level of service or route that was that was temporary suspended? This our report on this aim part of everything we do for the next how long the six months or so that we anticipate. Um, so that there will always be a, accompanying all the public outreach that we will also continue um, all during that period of time. So that this is public, it's transparent. Every decision we're making and how we're making it, how well we're doing it, how much is this course correction working, it'll be all publicly available and reported out, not only to you, but to the Well, let me, I'm going to ask a question. So these temporary modifications, driver shortage, um, Sally, all the other stuff we talked about. If we do not address the driver shortage, if we don't get enough drivers, we don't do the use modification, we will find ourselves going past six to nine months, maybe. The way that the federal transit regulation works on this for temporary emergency service model is they allow us to do this to address this kind of emergency situation for up to 12 months. About 12 months, and we really need to identify that around that nine to 10 month mark. If we're not seeing that increase in operator hiring and replacement of operators, and, you know, thinking we're also going to present a couple of other ideas of some other things we think we can do as fillers, kinds of things, mm -hmm. in addition to the hiring of operators. But if all those things aren't working by the time we get to about nine, 10 months, then we're going to be back in front of you. I don't anticipate this happening, but if it did, we would be back in front of you to say this temporary service mod must become a permanent service mod. And all of the other federal requirements that we have to meet at that point in equity analysis and a lot of you know formal uh, you know sorts of activities and so forth would be required at that point. I just don't think that's going to happen because I'm confident in what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. 
but I also believe it is absolutely critical that every single month, every single week in your snapshot, and every single month in your open board meetings and committee meetings, we need to report out on this so that it, there's no surprises. We don't get to six or get to nine months and we go, well, I have no idea. It's not getting better. You're going to know every month, which means the changes may be incrementally, we may see them incrementally, but nonetheless, you're going to see whether we're trending towards by month three, four. You're going to see how are we trending for this, and are we, in fact, you're going to see the service reliability numbers that are almost immediately going to force correct. And then you're going to be able to go, but yeah, but what are you doing for help? And then we're going to be reporting. Yeah, my reason for asking is because. I don't want anybody to get a piece of their minds that this temporary modification will end in nine months. It may not. It may not. Because you, 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 you can go out for 12 months. If so we just need to be clear. We do, but I, our aim is I want to be aggressive with our aim. Right, but, but I'm, I'm saying the reality is that we can go 12 months. And, you, and if you tell me it's six to nine months, you know, then they like it was 12 months. We just have to state what's in the regs. Well, the regs permit us to do this for up to 12 months, right. but our performance goal, and it's the one I want you to hold us accountable to as well. Our performance goal is to get this course correct within six to nine months, and you're going to know it because we're going to be reporting and reporting and reporting, and we're going to do that because that's the right thing. Because um, for you all as stewards, and as the, you know, the government's body for us, and for us in all of our collective responsibility or to the residents that are here. Well, I'm that's a train. Um, the that, uh, the number of drivers, does that reflect the number of drivers that we should have? Um, it, it can and will. I mean, what we should do is once we, once the master transit plan says, look, this is our vision for the future, and this is the kind of system we want to have, and this is how much service we want to provide in these areas and so forth, and the kind of service. One of the things we would do with that is we would then go, okay, well, what does it take to deliver that? What's the resource you need to deliver that both financially and from the staffing perspective? And that would be a part of the overall recommendation so we would know where we've got to get to. I um I know that um, I know how hard this is. I know how hard it is going to be for some members of our community. There are some things that we haven't gotten to yet that I believe are things we need to be able to see that we really can feel very deliberate, intentional, and um, earnest about figuring out what are some ways we can mitigate, minimize, out best we can in this scenario, knowing that it is absolutely So if we, if maybe we go ahead and do a little bit more through this presentation because I know how hard this is going to be and I also know it's absolutely but I think there's some of those other pieces. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, you want to continue through the presentation? Yep, let's go ahead and uh, jump uh, forward about three slides. Now for each route, I just want to make, we'll go through the route uh, numbers very fast. We identified the riders per trip for the period of March through August. All of the red highlighted trips are trips that we carried less than 10 rides um, on that trip on average. And so, for example, on route four, you can see there were some good trips that unfortunately we're going to be suspending. Um, until we can return Route 4, but it's also reasonably close walk to especially Route 14, where we hope we'll be able to accommodate many of these riders. Go to the next one. This is the Route uh, 11. Again, very close to other routes. Here we also have Route 31, I believe, that's uh, close uh, to portion um, of the route as well. And uh, again, this just shows the average rides per trip that were being carried on this route. One more, the Route 20. And for, go to the next one, there you go. For Route 20, I'm back up, I'm sorry. For Route 20, you can see the rides per trip are very low for all of the, uh, of the trips that are being taken. And this one will be suspended for now. Hopefully we'll be able to figure out a different service method because this route just really isn't working right now for the customers. 
Let's go ahead to the next one. Now, we also looked at where we had to cut some trips um, out of the, uh, the service. And so this particular uh, 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 graph shows by route the number of weekly trips. That's over about four columns, five columns over is the total number of weekly trips. And then the number of weekly trips that we're suspending, and then the estimated number of riders that are impacted on those trips. Now, I want to identify, especially for us, Route 29, which is serving both the, uh, the Carver Heights and the Cloverdale uh, neighborhoods. Um, we've worked with the city to uh, extend the, uh, the DOT um, service out to Carver Heights and Cloverdale neighborhoods, so we think we'll be able to minimize the impact on Route 29. Now, we'll go through uh, just some of the other maps again so you can see and go to the next slide. You can see for each of the services, the low ridership trips, and it is some of these low ridership trips that we are cutting out. Go to the next one, which is 3B. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize for both 3 and 3B is the uh, uh, section closest to town that has very high ridership, but has the duplicate routes, both 3 and 3B in the high ridership segments. Here it's shown as segment one on Route 3B. So even though we're going to cut out some service, people may not actually have uh, or miss service on Route 3 and 3B. Go ahead. Here is Route 6. I want to emphasize on Route 6, we've also done a minor realignment and change. So it will actually be serving the, uh, the Walmart um, that is across from the uh, Savannah Mall. And we wanted to make sure that this service was serving well the uh, Veterans uh, um, Clinic that is right there by uh, Savannah Mall. Go ahead and another one. Um, this is uh, Route 28, um, Waters uh, Street. Um, we have Route 28 and 27. That actually will have little change from its existing service. We were returning one additional bus on the 27th that we won't be. Go ahead, keep going. And the, the 29 we've already talked about. The uh, segments that are um, uh, changing essentially will be able to cover both segments three and four will be uh, uh, from the DOT um, uh, service extension. Keep going. There are two route alignment changes. Route 12, which serves uh, out to Wilmington Island, really has very low um, ridership in that um, section, but Route 10, will continue to provide service to Wilmington Island. And Route 14, your best route. We're trying though to cut the travel time on the route, the cycle time from two and a half hours to two hours. And that saves one bus and 90 weekly hours when we make that change. So we're cutting out the, the loop at the Savannah Mall and we're providing the service at the Savannah, Savannah Mall with our Route 6 but uh, um, uh, the service Route 14 will now turn around at the Abercorn Street Walmart. Go ahead to the next couple of slides. This just shows Route 12 and then Route 14 and the changes that are uh, envisioned. One more. I wanted to emphasize to folks that, you know, we've talked about this last mile ideas. And we are evaluating uh, future alternatives that could use a user side subsidy for taxi or rideshare um, services. The way it would work is we'd have multiple firms that would be engaged in the service. Riders could purchase a, uh, a shared ride voucher through CAT that would limit the amount of subsidy we'd provide. We're evaluating contractual terms, requirements, and subsidy amounts and we'll be contacting taxi companies and rideshare companies to determine their interest. This isn't ready 
for your uh, consideration yet. But we wanted you to know that we are seriously looking at a user side subsidy alternative uh, to cover some of the low ridership areas that for now we're having to suspend. With that, I'll be glad to answer any other questions that you all have. I want to mention too, in addition to the user side uh, subsidy alternative, we're also examining if there are any other uh, uh, operator arrangements that we can explore that would fit within our insurance and uh, legal protocols and FDA requirements and so forth um, that would enable us to even have uh, a temporary operator situation. And again, it's going to require some work, not really for the consideration at this point, but we wanted you to know that we're trying to uncover every possibility we can to bring home service back to the youth. But we are, uh, you know, we're, we're being very deliberate in Can I just make a suggestion also? I guess it's not for my benefit. Well, we have these presentations and these um, PowerPoints. Did they go about to get them in advance? We did. We sent them. Um, this was actually sent to you in a snapshot. Um, this so, one was? Yes, ma'am. When? Uh, well, we did it at the last meeting, um, and then I followed up with it in a snapshot after that. We This same presentation, a little bit edited differently right. than some of the other files today, but not much. It's still essentially the same one. We showed it last month's board meeting, and we sent it out separately. But I, I'm glad to send it out again and understand your request. Dr. Yeah, I, I don't have a hot part with this particular. There, there's also a one pager that you had asked about. Um, do we have the one pager where we can pop it up in our report? I just would like for them to see that as well because that may be that is a very useful, you know, all in the, the details that a board member would want to have. There's also like when you're talking to someone about this, having a whole deck is probably not really practical. On the other hand, there's a, as soon as you bring it up, there's a one pager that we have that kind of gives you a snapshot view of what all of this involves and what the trade-offs are and what we can do. It has a passenger on uh, that, that this may be one way that you can use this route. And here's what the proof of the summary changes are. But I think it's there. Um, and Faye, this is the uh, one pager. Yes. Um, that uh, does show all of the uh, the changes. And this was this is being distributed as widely as we can get it out. As a matter of fact, that's one that I think goes back to to the suggestion that you all made as directors and board members earlier about distributing things on the buses. That's an excellent thing to get out because not only does it tell you about yours, mm -hmm. but it tells you about others. And as you talk to people and as you make your way through the system, you've really got the, the full picture. So I think that this is a great um, and and, uh, and just, just I'm okay with one pager for whatever reason, but as but a board you, member, I'd like to see the whole thing. You want that digital? We're going to send that out again following this meeting. The one that's presented today, we will send it out again. Like I said, it's got some minor changes to it from the one you saw last month. We'll send it out again. Two, two things I've got. Um, if, we, if we do end up handing something out, I, I honestly like anything that has Kat's name on it. On the bottom to have sign up for text messages at this number. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be really annoying with that. Um, <laughs> and um, a lot of times when I'm figuring out how I'm going to route out a cat bus, I use Google um, to do the transit planning. Um, and when does that get updated to reflect these changes? There will actually be our conference, and Ashley and uh, Mr. Richard can correct me. There will be a month lag from the time this goes into place to the time we can't correct. No, we will. Um, we start the service change on October 31st, so technology will be, It'll be there already. I thought that there was something we had one month lag on it. Absolutely. Smaller shows, so that it's about twenty. So um, smaller shows, it's still one drive. I mean, it's still a matter of having the operator. Regardless of what kind of difference, it's always we keep going back to the operator. 
that's the it's a corporate division it's service services here right now operating here we got to bring service to make the operator level until we can start to the operator level But it is the right right thing to do. It's 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 you know I, it's so much better for the right thing to do is um doing you know advancing what we're doing in some way. But I look at this in a, in a very different way, similarly because when there's no um you can't imagine. Then um, that also impacts our brand. We don't want that to have to undercut that kind of brand recovery. So th this is a very necessary hard step, but it's the kind of thing you have to do. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, the next thing is we have a presentation from the court in here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> She's found this fascinating. Yeah, they distribute those funds. 
distribute those funds based on efforts like this. So there is money that is pulled in to get money boost, all the traditional money. But, um, but what they do is based upon this, everybody coming together to like to do um, every other month. Like, you're, like we're doing here, and like they do with the PO, we come together and we talk about all the needs regionally. And we talk about how it all fits together, how we need to go around everywhere with all kinds of different investments, um, and whether that's roads, and bridges, or transit, or sidewalks, or highways, all those things, right? So we talk about all that and we come up with a plan that helps us all figure out then how we resource, because there's never enough resources to yeah. do everything we want to do. It's a matter of then trying to figure out how are we going to go, what's the priority, that. and that collaborative body. But they do, but they, there is dedicated funding that comes to every new PO in the state. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess I'll just jump right back into it. So our new for its revenue plan covers 2025 to 2050, so it is a 25 year plan. Um, and it's projected to be adopted in the summer of 2024. Um, so these are just some of the multi-modal documents um, that contribute to the new for its revenue plan. So we have something from um, some documents like the shopping demand model, the congestion management process. And for transit, we also include CAT documents into our planning development for our moving forward to get um, We also cover um, bike and pedestrian uh, projects. So that includes the model of transportation plan update and the plan update. So these plans are also being updated right now, and I'm the one that is in charge of that update process. Um, so a lot of what we're learning in the report together plan will directly impact the non-motorized plan. And one of the things I was mentioning here too that I think is really important to know is if you look back to the last uh, plan that they involved in the last EPO plan, the transit component of it was was not as robust. And the fact that we're doing our master plan and these other planning efforts at the same time and in this kind of collaboration that we've heard described means that the transit component of this plan is going to be very robust. And it means that that transition to both be prioritized this original effort to be understood in terms of system level connectivity. It's, it's exactly where we should be. Um, but the last one we were to agree. We actually talk that on my organization a lot about how lucky it is that a lot of these plan updates are aligned together. And so it's really helpful in just um, putting it together this plan because they're huge. So it's good to have a lot of help and a lot of support. Um, so this is just describing why we need to put it together to have a plan. Uh, for one, it is a 25 year plan, so it impacts transportation planning for decades. So that already puts a uh, kind of high importance on the one planet for such a, a long range farm to implement. It also helps us assess transportation goals and priorities. So um, the last plan update was, I think, uh, the 2045 plan update. And since then, there have been some changes in what we're thinking about certain transportation topics. So one of those, um, I think that's really important, and I guess what we're here is public transportation. Seen a lot of people, especially people in the younger generation, having a higher interest in public transportation and walkable cities in general. And so it's necessary for our plans to reflect those changes in people's minds. Okay, good. <laughs> um, and it also gives the public a chance to uh, direct input into the future direction um, of our area. And then I put in court here that transportation access is one has been important and creating an equitable society. Um, and so there's a lot of research to show that transportation access um, is necessary and vital to uh, so upward social mobility and then access to economic resources, health resources, and really just uh, creating vibrant communities. So this is a development process. We're in the very beginning. So we're really just intaking a lot of data so some of that data is from the outreach data. Um, some of it is coming from chat. Um, we're trying to work with as many organizations as possible to get as much data as we can. And then we use that to update our additional goals um, do further analysis. And then finally, after basically all this analysis and data intake, we can recommend a financially constrained 
plan. Uh, so basically, our financially constrained list of projects that we want to invest money in. Um, so we are at the very beginning, which is great because, uh, but earlier we get input, um, the more likely it is to make a new plan. Um, and so right now we're going to focus on public outreach um, and giving presentations such as this. But there will be further, uh, I guess, opportunities to give public outreach. But the earlier, the better. So that's why we really wanted to collaborate with Kat, just because there are a lot of people that we have to benefit from the this plan. And the earlier they give that input, the better it is for them. Um, so these are just our draft goals and objectives. We have safety and security, control and reliability, access to equity, and we also have stewardship and system and environmental preservation. So our goals and objectives are not totally set in stone. They can be updated, um, and we will update these according to some of the information we get from our public outreach efforts. And so now I just have to some of the public engagement that we've been doing. Uh, we've been doing virtual meetings, in person meetings, and giving presentations such as this. And then also, uh, we have a few surveys. So, some of what we've been hearing um, is that crosswalk shifts that have been so many aesthetic designs. Um, we've gotten comment that we should try to contact people who live in the county for their community. And then we also um, got comments that we should. Opportunities at nursing homes to give elderly people a chance to give their annual plan. And this is just a uh, page showing so far um, public engagement. Um, and then again, it's been shared on uh, a lot of websites uh, for for City Savannah and other organizations in the area. And that's been really helpful in kind of tracking our response um, on the public. So uh, these are just our public meetings. So we're going to have several throughout October and then November. Uh, this one here is not on the slide because it's kind of so um, But just uh, this is just kind of a short list of some of the public meetings we have. So if you know and that would be interested, you can know, just show me the slide or you can go to the website so that they can join and get their input as well. Um, we also have a public survey running. Um, as of last week, it was at 249. I think uh, it's a little bit, it's getting closer to 360 or 370 now. Um, so it's been live since September 1st. We're going to have the four languages. We're going to have English, Spanish, Japanese, and Chinese. Um, and it covers a uh, multitude of topics such as roadways, bicycles, uh, pedestrians, public transportation, equity, and resilience. And a major goal of our survey is to have as close to a representative um, sample of our population as possible. Um, I think anyone working within public outreach knows how hard it is to get anyone to respond to any of your surveys and especially get it as representative of your actual population. But we still want uh, everyone to have input on the plan. So right now, these are some of the zip codes that are responding the most. Uh, and we ultimately want more areas uh, to respond to the survey, just so we can have an equitable and inclusive um, input on this plan. Um, and this is just showing a little bit of who's taking the survey. So the vast majority of people who have taken it do drive their own vehicles, so they have a personal car. Um, and in terms of race, it's mostly um, white residents that are taking that are taking the survey. And so we definitely want input. Um, that is diverse and reflective of the core NPO area of Chatham, Effingham, and Bryan County. Um, so far, the largest age group to take the survey uh, is between the ages of 45 and 64, and the largest household income um, tends to uh, they make 100,000 or more. So we definitely want um, people with different age groups, people with different income to be able to know about this plan and get their input as well. I just wanted to um, highlight some of the more interesting results that we have. And we have a soft deadline for October 21st on this, but we can talk and we're likely to get extended into November so people have more opportunity to take the survey. Um, so, in general, 
so one of the responses that respondents gave is that they uh, one of the major goals that they want is to maintain and repair uh, local roadways, infrastructure, and facilities. So um, this one was kind of the top goal for a lot of respondents. However, um, despite the fact that the majority of people that took the survey on a personal vehicle, there was still significant interest in a local rail service and public transportation. So um, this is just showing one of the questions that we have. And in second and third place, um, our goals are essentially related to public transit and rail system. Um, respondents also want bike lanes that are protected by a barrier and railways. So uh, a lot of respondents uh, want to feel, I guess, a little bit more protected, uh, more covered by something when they're biking, especially when they're on those higher capacity, higher um, speed roads. So they would prefer bike lanes that are separated from track. Um, so these seven percent respondents uh, prioritize increasing green and major based infrastructure on our and 74 percent respondents uh, prioritize identifying and targeting uh, areas where transit investment should be prioritized. And so I thought that was an interesting response because I feel like it already aligns with what a lot of local organizations already want. So this is just a slide showing you uh, some of our, uh, where you can access some of these resources, such as the survey. And then also our website, which has a little bit more information on um, the foreign field and the Metropolitan Transportation Plan update. And this is just a slide showing just how you can get involved. So you can take a survey or the comment map survey. So we actually have two surveys now. One is just kind of your um, traditional um, survey. Uh, and another one is our comment survey. You go on the map. And identify a specific area and put a pin on that map, and then write out your opinion on what that area means, or maybe an opportunity to put that area. Uh, we also have social media. So I think Kat might be following us on social media. Okay, that's great. That's, <laughs> that's really, really helpful to the board be able to get the word out. Um, attending public meetings, call, text, and email. Um, I think one of the slides has an email. Uh, to our transportation administration director and our executive director to respond to you. And of course, we have our website. So, this final slide is just uh, who you can call and get to the email to uh, get connected and learn more about the plan and then also to get resources to spread the plan. So, the foreign field is really open to collaborating with as much as possible. So, if you need more brochures or Physical copies of the survey or really any other resources, we're happy to give them out just so we can drive up um, input on this plan update. And this is just a QR code to take the survey if you have not already taken. So if you'd like to, you can just uh, scan it and the survey is not too long. So that's good. Um, so some of the next steps we have for plan is just to pursue more uh, public outreach. And then using that, using the data that we get from our public outreach to analyze and update the plan goals and objectives. And then uh, include that public outreach into the report to get plan and other plan goals. We have had a wonderful presentation, and we appreciate so much the partnership uh, for EPO was at our meeting um, on. Saturday, and yeah, we have been as has been indicated. Also, have core EPO on our stakeholder meetings, um, and so the collaboration here is very strong and very necessary. These were the questions earlier about how the region fits in with the things that we're doing as well. These are exciting times for all of us. I think I'll see some of you on Thursday, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Peter, as well as all the presentations and comments and staff that they have all the numbers on up. Man, at this time, I'd like to join us. Wait, Dad, this was the day we should have done.
and, and Dr. Robinson, I just sent the email about lunch to the board. So. <laughs> Asia, Asia. Thank <laughs> you.